This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Information at VAChamber.com. Virginia hospitals and health systems provide jobs. They support our economy and promote public health. Local hospitals are always open to help people with unexpected health needs. Having a stable health care network is vital. Virginia hospitals are our lifeline. I just received a letter from a student who thanked me for instilling the love of math in him. That's why I teach. Brought to you by the Virginia Education Association. Because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond, and you're in for a special treat because we have three experts in, from different backgrounds, all in, in education. We have the chair, Delegate Steve Landis, chair of the House Education Committee, and also vice chair of appropriations, Delegate Lamont Bagby, former member of the Henrico County School Board, and a member of the House of Delegates, and Kimberly Gray, who's a uh, City Council elect in the city of Richmond and is on her last months of eight years of school board in the city of Richmond. So if you haven't figured it out already, we're going to be talking about education. And there's a great deal to talk about. And Delegate Landis, why don't you start us off with some of the, th some of the things you think are the kind of top, particularly on the agenda of the General Assembly to be working on as, you, as we move very quickly toward 2017 session. Well, David, I think uh, from the House standpoint, I think the Senate as well, we're really interested in, in looking closely at uh, kind of the redesign of high school. Uh, that's a work in progress. We have a new joint um, committee made up of the House Education Committee and the Senate Education Health Committee. Lamont and I both serve on that. And we're going to be looking at uh, the standards of quality, the standards of accreditation, and the SOLs and the changes that are going on there. We've obviously had some reforms with SOLs. I think you'll see that continue. Uh, we're also looking at uh, basically just kind of uh, the new and innovative ways that we can provide educational opportunities for our young people across the Commonwealth. And whether that's virtual education uh, or, as, as I mentioned, uh, looking at how we do assessments and, and maybe uh, bringing in other um, measurements and benchmarks in addition to SOLs, I think those are some of the things that we'll be looking at. I know, know if we'll actually see many new initiatives come forward um, because a lot of that work is going on. We just got started this year uh, with the new joint committee and it will take some time to bring forward um, recommendations. But we'll look forward to whatever the General Assembly uh, session may um, bring and, and uh, looking at additional reforms in the work we've already done. Lamont, you're serving on that same sub subcommittee that the chairman mentioned and, and you're not that far away from having served on the school board city of Enrico. So what, what are some of the thoughts that you have about uh, top issues coming up in 17? Well, I would echo the chairman, of course. <laughs> That's a smart thing to do, oh, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> but uh, I, I think what we do with the SOLs and, and, and how we participate in that process um, as a legislature is going to be critical. Um, there are a number of other people uh, or other groups working on this same issue. And what we have been trying to do, and I know what our agenda looks like for today and going forward, is trying to gather and put that together so that we're more informed coming into session and not waiting for them, uh, whether it's the, uh, one of the education associations or if it's the, um, the Board of Ed or our secretary, not waiting for them to give us that presentation during session. We want to be proactive uh, in this very important piece 
um, because when I visit schools and I know when they visit schools, um, one of the things that we hear that we can do better is assessments. And, and, and not only what do we do with the assessment mm. or, or how do we assess, but what do we do with that information once we have it. Um, and so I think that's the, the, the most critical pieces of the assessment and then how do we support the schools that are struggling. Um, not to go too long, but you go to a doctor's office and the doctor uh, says you have whatever. And then he tells you to, okay, and go home. Um, that's what, not what we want to do. We want to see what the issues are, see what the symptoms are, and then prescribe and, and, and find a way to support our schools and our students. Okay, thank you. Kim, I think as long as I've known you, you've had an interest in education Definitely. and now in, on the school board time. So from, from strictly from a local perspective, what do you see as some of the top or maybe the tough issues that would be facing? Well, one of the things that we've been challenged with is how do you account for the growth we've seen without getting hit with the cut points on the SOL. So we've seen a lot of our schools increase percentage-wise in pass rates, but because they didn't make 70% in certain categories or 75%, they still are considered failures. And then they continue on that even though they're improving, markedly improving, if they don't make those cuts, they end up in circumstances where they face possible takeover by the state or a total revamping of the, the staff in the school. So um, the sanctions are pretty severe and we are trying to do a better job showing how well our students are improving and measuring their growth because that, that makes a big difference. I, I know that we have to have standards because otherwise, you know, students fall by the wayside. But how do we measure when our students have improved, when, when we're getting them and they're reading on a first grade level in the fourth grade and we get them up to the third grade, that's, that's a lot of growth and a lot of progress, but we can't show it in the way that the current assessments are done. In another month, You'll mm -hmm. be moving to the city council where you'll be getting the request from the school board with regards to their, their budget. So you'll be wearing a, a different hat. Uh, as you reflect for just a moment on that, on that transition, um, you're not the only one from school board now who will be on city council from this right. last election. Well, and I think that not just having served on school board, but both Kristen Larson, who won the 4th District in the City of Richmond, coming from the school board and myself, we have small children in Richmond Public Schools. And I think that informs our decision making a lot. And um, one of the primary things, and we all know, that makes the most impact in the classroom is having a highly qualified teacher. We've been unable to keep to our commitments and paying those teachers their step increases. So that, that was a big part of our budget battle and we we phased it over two years so I think our challenge will be to make sure that that stays in this current budget and moving forward we continue with our commitments to our teachers. You know for the past so many years we've been talking about No Child Left Behind and now it's Every Student Succeeds Act, mm -hmm. ESSA as an acronym. Um, as, as you think of it from the policy side here at the Capitol or from the local side, how, how is, will this be changing what takes place in education in Virginia? Well, there were many of us that were never big fans of No Child Left Behind. It did not fit well with our, our standards of learning and kind of what Virginia had done uh, prior to No Child Left Behind coming into place. And actually, it, it, it put on an additional level or um, barriers for our local school systems not to have the time to really work with kids to try to see that improvement. And also, 100% um, um, uh, average yearly progress was just not an attainable goal for mm -hmm. most schools, not just in Virginia, but you know, nationwide. The Every Student Succeeds Act provides a lot of additional flexibility, so the state is really looking forward to having that flexibility, maybe getting back to what the original uh, intent of standards of learning was, and that was that we do testing, but we also provide school systems and individual students the time for remediation and really looking and focusing on how to improve their success. 
um, from year to year as opposed to just a test or benchmark test every year. And uh, we have started with the reduction of SOL tests, at least for the early grades, mm -hmm. and we hope that that will um, allow us an opportunity and, um, maybe in the future with the redesign of high school to maybe have uh, our SOL testing done by uh, grade 9 or 10. And that provides additional opportunities for students in, in high school. So um, I think um, that federal act, if, as long as it stays in place and as long as the federal government makes good on its promises related to the funding, will provide opportunity for Virginia. And we're really looking forward to that. One of the things I, I think that I understand is in there that would provide some funding in school systems where there's specific needs even to help in the recruiting of teachers or some I don't know if it's supplemental money or what it is. But I, I, I suppose with any change of administrations in Washington, there's always the, the, the concern and the question about how will it be moving, moving forward. But as, as you think about the the work that you're doing now beyond your delegate responsibilities in, in education. Uh, on this redesign of the high school, how do, how do you see that really, uh, how's that going to improve things? Well, I think that's yet to be seen because we're still exploring it. But I, um, before I joined the uh, Henrico School Board, I was a high school teacher. Yes. And so one of the things that I know for sure is we've been doing the same thing for a long time um, and supporting our high schools in the same way for a long time and just the just the idea of being able to have this conversation uh, on the state level I think has been very encouraging uh, with with everyone coming to the table and saying what should it look like uh, what are we preparing our students for and and, and do we need um, um, three math SOLs in high school do we need four English, excuse me, two English and, and four histories uh, um, SOLs in, in, in high school. Those are the things we're, we're exploring. And then also with that, looking at all the things related to uh, career and technical education, um, particularly in the area of, of certifications, because there are a number of young people that can go on and make good money coming out of high school um, with, with, the, with, with the proper certification. And also, partnering with our community colleges. I know here in, in the Richmond area, Richmond and Henrico have been working really hard to partner with J. Sergeant Reynolds uh, Community College to make sure that we have those partnerships to prepare our young people, not only those individuals that are going on to community college, but those that are going on to four-year colleges because we, we have a program in Henrico um, that allows students in high school to go ahead and start taking those courses for college mm -hmm. and they're, they're transferable to any other colleges, UVA, Norfolk State, uh, any of the colleges, in, uh, the, the, the state supported colleges in, in the Commonwealth. And so those are the things I think we need to start doing to think outside of the box, not just what we've been doing, but what, what can we do to, to not only support uh, the students and the teachers, but also the parents' pockets. Kim, let's bring up the subject of funding and start with you and others too, and certainly Steve wears the, the, the dual hats from the Appropriations Committee as well as education, but often we hear that, that there's some disparity in funding. Uh, and I think we, we hear that from jurisdictions that may feel like they're getting not getting as much as they, they need. How is it right now in Richmond? Well, it's been a challenge. The local composite index looks at Richmond as one of the wealthiest localities in the Commonwealth, and we're, we're wealthier than Loudoun. Our local contribution is a lot higher than I think it should be, considering the high poverty and um, the number of disadvantaged students that we serve. So um, we, along with the City of Richmond, the School Board, City of Richmond, and the Robbins Foundation and the Community Foundation funded a study um, done by a third party nonprofit called the Bellwether Group. And what we found is 78% of our students are considered disadvantaged. It mm. is up to two and a half times as much to educate students coming out of disadvantaged circumstances. And um, we know that we're not funded at the level that we need to to really make the impacts and to to save all of our children coming through the public school system. So um, 
the state funding formula is flawed. I think that it um, comes up every year. Um, we've asked for a study. I don't know that we have the atmosphere to, to generate a study because there are winners and losers in that, in that formulation. So, you know, it's one pot of money and there are lots of localities who benefit a great deal from the way that formula is calculated. So we're looking at um, other ways to compel our state legislators to look at Richmond, um, not unlike Baltimore and um, other capital cities because we have a lot of real estate that is state-owned properties that's not generating the tax revenue to compensate for the additional local funding that we have to put into public schools. Is, is that some of what drives up the composite index or something, the, the state-owned property? The, 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 fun, the funding um, mechanism um, is, is very old. The, the difficulty, and, and you rightly pointed out, the difficulty is um, when you look at making changes, there are winners and losers. And uh, whether it's rural areas or um, um, inner cities uh, like Richmond or metropolitan areas, uh, th the funding formula probably doesn't reflect mm. the true nature of what's going on with those local economies and, and the fact that there are higher numbers of uh, free and reduced lunch uh, children um, than, the, than the formula really takes into account. What I think, um, given that political reality mm -hmm. of, of trying to unwind that formula that's been in place a long time, what I really think we need to do, and one of the things Lamont and I hopefully will have a chance to do, is looking at the standards of quality and providing more flexibility for the use of where the standards are. We, we really, really now specifically look at positions and don't allow the localities, local school systems, some flexibility with those positions. And what I would really hope we would be able to do is look at the standards of quality, provide some flexibility so that the local school system, working with their local elected officials on city councils or boards of supervisors, to look at those um, positions and we could do it more, I don't want to say a block grant, but more like a block grant where the funding is there um, based on you know, uh, the basic um, standard that we have in a range, but provide them the flexibility, whether it's you know, if they need more reading specialists as opposed to other support staff, allow them that flexibility. And I think that would um, allow um, some opportunities for localities, whether it's Richmond or others, uh, to really um, provide a better educational opportunity for their young people based on the need in the specific school or school division. So that's just my idea of something mm -hmm. we could look at. And I think there's some support for that. And we're coming up at the time of the uh, recommendation from the Board of Education on the changes. And uh, at, a, at a time when the Commonwealth's budget is under some real stress and there's some uh, significant increases being recommended from the Board of Education. So it's a it's, they see the need, you, you see the need, but, but the funds aren't there. So it, it's a challenging time. It is. And the, the challenge is that um, the growth rates we're seeing in Virginia are much less than we've historically seen. Mm -hmm. and, and localities are experiencing that as well. And that impacts education, obviously, because um, it is a 50-50 proposition generally. Uh, some places higher, some places lower, depending on the formula again, but okay. uh, that is the challenge. I think um, also, David, the thing that we have an opportunity to look at is not only the SOQs, but the standards of accreditation and what we, what we allow there. And if we ratchet back even further the standards of learning with the high school redesign, there's some opportunities for flexibility, and I think that's what I'm hearing from most school divisions is just give us more flexibility. And, you know, we do spend about 30% of the state budget on K through 12. So it is a large part of the state budget, the single largest um, expenditure area. So it is a priority from the state standpoint. But again, the challenge is with, with um, revenues growing at a very slow rate, um, cost of everything keeps going up. And then if you're trying to retain and recruit, you know, the talent for the teacher pool, that's the, uh, the real concern that we see going forward. How does that flexibility sound with Henrico connecting you there in Richmond? How, how does that? I think it's, it's going to be very helpful um, moving forward if we are allowed that flexibility. What we found in the budget 
is that money is sent down from the federal and state government and it has to be spent in speci very specified ways and it makes it harder for us um, when we have um, facilities that are crumbling and we have other things that crop up we can't just move money from one pot to another there's there's almost zero flexibility with certain funding mm -hmm. streams that come down from the state and federal government so people you know wonder why we don't do things a certain way um, there, there are very specific and prescribed ways that that money is to be spent so um, this would be helpful for us. I think also looking at our facilities and um, doing some building consolidations because we operate at a much lower level of efficiency than our surrounding counties because we have smaller school buildings, especially at the secondary level. So, I think also if the if we are able to on the state level support some of our schools. Um, school districts to do some more regional uh, cooperation uh, mm -hmm. with some of our specialty mm -hmm. programs, um, whether it's CTE programs or whether it's uh, um, serving our students with special needs. Uh, I think that we would experience some savings there as well. Um, but I, I don't want to get lost and, and just focus only on education um, committees and boards and so forth because I think what, ha what happens is we have so many other components or, or, or um, uh, attributing factors uh, like mental health support and, 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 and the poverty rate uh, that also impact um, our school systems. And so we look at the result via SOLs or standardized testing or attendance, but we're not looking at some of the things that contributed, contribute to those, those results. Um, and those impacts uh, from other uh, um, 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 state or local uh, parts of our government, whether it's mental health support or um, law enforcement, those things also, I think, uh, are things we also have to look at when we're looking at um, our pu public right. education system. Yeah, thank you for broadening that out. In our closing couple of minutes, what's something you said, I thought David was gonna ask about this, and David has not. Uh, <laughs> Steve, any? Well, um, I thought you might ask uh, more about, you know, um, you, and you started with uh, the first question. You know, I don't, um, there aren't a lot of specifics we think that we're going to see this session right. based okay. on the fact that um, the groups that uh, Lamont mentioned that are the SOL Innovation Reform Committee, uh, the governor and the secretary uh, are looking at various things. We think there'll be some recommendations, but most of us are trying to get together collectively before we just kind of charge down the road and say this right. is the way we're going right. to go. We want to get consensus both in the legislative branch but also with our partners at the local level, uh, local school boards, uh, the superintendents, uh, principals, the teachers. We need to all be on the same page and say we do think this is the direction generally we need to go. Then we can work out the details and I think that's going to occur. Um, you'll see some of that um, dialogue and discussion you know, coming up to the legislative session, then after the legislative session, you know, and going into the next um, the next session for 2018, that also times um, it well with any changes we make. It's going to take money, um, you know, for good or bad. That's where everything kind of comes back to at the mm -hmm. local or the state level, and it'll also be at the beginning of a new biennial budget, which I think will be very good when we're looking at the policy and the budget uh, areas in tandem. Kim, something else that I left out? Well, I think um, one of the things that from a local level that we'll be looking at is closing the technology gap with our students mm. and making sure that um, in the city, all of the online, all of the SOL testing has um, started happening online, and we saw a huge gap in our students' ability to even operate a mouse and computer because that was their first experience. So mm. we, are, we are working very hard to close the gap to provide our students with technology ahead of testing time and also um, working with some local government and private industry folks to afford access to the internet for our students. Well, I want to thank all three of you, and Lamont, you certainly laid out some other big areas to be, to be looked at. Appreciate the work, and we'll be following what happens this session, and then as you're saying, looking forward on to 
the next session, the next budget. So thank you, one and all. Thank you. Thanks, David. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. For jobs, the economy, and public health, Virginia Hospitals, our lifeline. The Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.